Now is Roblox 30. We've talked about his dad a ton and the respect that I have for his father. We have the son, and I want to say, Jack McCain, I went through – it's got to be weird, first of all, to go through a bunch of websites and see pictures of yourself whenever you're little. <laughs> One of the, the favorite ones that I came across was, now you're this badass helicopter pilot, U.S. Naval Academy graduate yourself, but it was Jack McCain plays with spider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, it made Sear School a real interesting place to be when I went through that much access yeah. to information. I actually was in uh, Fallujah when your brother was there, and I remember them saying, Sir McCain's son is in theater, and Mattis goes, I don't give a shit. Who's <laughs> he's a Marine, he's going to do the damn job. <laughs> you know, he, he tells a story um, about uh, he was, uh, I don't know which river it was because unfortunately I'm not as familiar with Iraq. But uh, they had turned an MRAP over um, and essentially were in the process. Nobody got hurt. Everybody made it out okay. But they had to dig it out. And um, he's knee-deep in water trying to help dig the MRAP out. And a gunnery sergeant comes up to him and goes, Hey, McCain, your dad just won the New Hampshire primary. Get back to work. <laughs> what a crazy life, man. <laughs> So you grew up in a, obviously a super political family. Your dad is a national hero and everybody respects him. I imagine that's like one of the Manning kids getting into football when you decided to go to the Naval Academy. What kind of went through your head? Was that an aspiration that you had from when you were younger to go and follow in your father's footsteps? I had, uh, I think brainwashed is probably the right term. Um, <laughs> I attended a Naval Academy graduation when I was maybe seven. Uh, it went to almost every Army Navy game every year, so they definitely implanted the idea pretty early. Um, it was the only college that I applied to. Um, so, I, did you have any trouble finding a senator to sign off on you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't. I couldn't use him, uh, which you know, for the best, obviously. But uh, I actually I interviewed with one of the local congressmen who I had kind of grown up with, so. A pretty incestuous to say the least uh, <laughs> but um, I but I was not the greatest student in the world so I went to the Naval Academy prep school for a year first um, and kind of rebelled against the system a little bit uh, okay. I was was not the greatest student um, and um, just barely managed to scrape in and uh, once getting to the Naval Academy I had already kind of spent a year of my life getting there. So at that point, there was no looking back. I just had to somehow find the grades to, to get through. Um, and not only that, but you went on and a lot of people who have like distinguished backgrounds, like with families and things like that, they kind of stay away from the fray. Like you'll see them in different types of jobs, but you didn't do that. You went out to become a helicopter pilot to be in support. What was your parents' reaction whenever you told them what career path you wanted to take? I think my dad uh, was pretty pissed when I first told him I wanted to be a helicopter pilot. Yeah, he's um, like, do you know what happened to pilots? <laughs> <laughs> Can't happen. Not great. <laughs> he, he always, um, he wanted me to be a jet aviator uh, because that was what he did. He, right. However old he got, um, he was always an attack pilot at heart, uh, which is something I really didn't understand until later on in life. He always had that mentality, kind of uh, the way he, he approached life. So um, I was not the greatest fixed wing pilot in the world and uh, I wanted to do search and rescue. So um, helicopter piloting uh, was, I took, kind of took to it like a fish to water because flying a helicopter is like flying a big old magic carpet. It's awesome. Oh, I bet. Can you walk us through the first time whenever you, you actually get your helicopter? Because there's so much training that goes on with being a helicopter pilot. I know a lot of times, I don't know if this was your case, I hear from pilots all the time, they're like, dude, we're just in a holding pattern at school. We're not doing shit. We're just hanging out. When you finally get to be a pilot where you want to be in a combat zone, was there a moment like, okay, this is real. I'm here. Yeah. Um, you know, my first tour... Uh, I went to, to Guam, um, and a lot of the reason I picked Guam was because it was as far from any flag as I could get, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a duty station that had a high op tempo, and um, they had been doing the medevac mission in Iraq as well. Um, so I, I get there, and uh, my first couple of deployments were with the Marines or uh, Marine Expeditionary Units going out and floating around in the ocean. Um, so there were definitely moments of interest and danger and excitement, but uh, 
the first time I took an alpha model Blackhawk without any doors on it uh, and flew off into the desert at 80 feet in Kandahar. I remember looking out, seeing the, the low houses made out of the, the local mud and just thinking, okay, this is a, this is a combat tour. And it feels like all those, because I remember my first experience being on a helicopter and looking out the back with the, the gates were down. And it feels like you're in a movie, but you're like, there's not, <laughs> if there's bullets, it's not going to be from my surround sound this time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it was, um, and especially being a Navy guy, I was the only Navy pilot in my unit. So this was no, nothing like I had ever known. I had no experience in, um, I had done maybe one or two dust landings in my life. And now it was, okay, you've got to train Afghan pilots to land in the dust. So try not to mess it up. Ugh. And and you've done something that I think is different from a lot of people with your background as well. Because a lot of people say, well, going to the Naval Academy, his father went there. It's a very prestigious school. It could be the backbone of a life in politics like his dad. But you would think that if that was your goal, you continued on after your initial requirement of serving, right? I did. Um, I, depending on how, uh, what, what you select, uh, you owe a certain number of years. So I continued, um, a little bit on after my commitment was up, um, especially getting the chance to go to Afghanistan. But, um, I, th I think one of the points you might be, <laughs> be driving at is why am I not in politics right now? <laughs> Right. And, and not only that, but I think that it's important for people because we have a, a large pro, uh, portion of our listeners are civilian. What, was it, what made it important for you to go back to Afghanistan? Um, I, first of all, I was teaching at the Naval Academy, which was a, an amazing tour. Um, but I also got a little bit bored uh, and felt like... Um, there was a war going on and I needed to do everything I could to get there so I could contribute. So I actually had volunteered for a ground job. Um, I don't remember what my first set of orders was supposed to be, but by luck and happenstance, uh, we had just sold the Afghans a large number of uh, old UH sixties. And so speaking the language and knowing how to fly a helicopter seemed like a pretty good fit. So the military sort of said, all right, boy, do we have a job for you? And, uh, <laughs> That's, that's how I ended up there. But I wanted to get there. Obviously, there's the, I had never been to a combat zone. Everyone in the military at some point, I, I think, wants to get there. They want to be able to test themselves and, and face that danger. But also, if, the, if it wasn't going to be me, it was going to have to be somebody else. It might as well be me. Yeah, I, I had that same feeling. It took me about four years until I went to Iraq whenever I was in. And I, my mindset's different now. I look at it as almost a foolish endeavor, like right. like you, like especially after getting shot and shit. Like, I was like, maybe it's <laughs> so hard to go. But it to me, it was almost like the equivalent of every single day you're going to go out there to football practice, but you're never going to actually play in the game. And exactly. you just kind of want to go play in the game. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. It was, um, and as a Navy guy, the chance to go do that. I mean, I I know just about every other Navy helicopter pilot would have knifed me to get that job. Um, they probably wouldn't have volunteered to go ground pound to do it. But uh, I, I know that the rarity of the opportunity was something that I couldn't, couldn't pass up. Um, so looking back now at your deployment, what would you say, has there been anything that's kind of shaped you as a person from what you saw in Afghanistan that'll shape your policy or shape anything, uh, your ideals moving forward? Yeah, I think um, the thing that struck me most and I know is going to stick with me forever. Uh, I was actually talking about this last night. Um, I'll use one of my pilots as an example. It's a guy, uh, I'll just call him Major S because I try not to, to give their names away. But that major has been... I do. I give out full Christian names, <laughs> especially if I'm talking shit. <laughs> full, full names, date of birth, location. The last four. I don't give out the full Social Security, but I'll give out the last four in a heartbeat. <laughs> so Major S was an Afghan helicopter pilot. He had been flying in Kandahar for seven years. Thousands of combat missions. Uh, he had been wounded. Um, I, from what I remember, he'd been shot down. And... He still got in the aircraft and did it every day. I had other pilots that, uh, for instance, we had one specific issue where we had uh, Afghan crews in an LZ. 
they started taking indirect fire. Um, usually, obviously, your reaction is going to be, okay, let's get out of the LZ. But the aircraft commander saw uh, an individual get hit by IDF, go down, and he stayed in the LZ under IDF in order to make sure that that guy got put in the aircraft uh, before he left. But you don't really hear those stories about the Afghan war. You hear there are problems, you hear you know, we have logistics issues and money and corruption, which there's no simple fix. There are obviously um, systemic issues that need to be addressed with both uh, American support and, and with the Afghan military. But the sheer bravery of that I only was able to interact with the pilots and the crew chiefs, but bravery of those guys is something that will stick with me forever. And do you think that'll help you like as you move forward? Because I know you're, you said before we started recording that you're trying to transition from the active duty side to the reserve side. When you move forward, is those stories of like people being human and humanity? Because I think when you're at war for 17, 18 years, you can lose sight of humanity on a lot of sides. And we talk about that, whether it's the Iraqis, that people from Afghanistan or now people in Mexico, we can mm-hmm. kind of lose sight of people's humanness. Is that something that you want to concentrate on? Yes. Um, if I've taken one thing away from this deployment, uh, I feel a much more personal responsibility now to try to help either bring closure, support democracy, freedom, right, uh, uh, human rights and freedom in Afghanistan, because um, not only do I have a responsibility, but the American people do. So whatever form that takes, I'm not sure, but it has become a, a very compelling force for me. Um, that I want to find some way to continue to contribute, whether it's NGO work or or um, whatever. It's uh, it's kind of an overwhelming urge. So what's what's next for you? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, right now, I am off the government dole until I get reserve orders, <laughs> um, which first time since I was 18 years old, so that's a little scary. Uh, oh, I bet. What's next is I have to find a job so I can continue to have a roof over my head and put food on my table. Uh, but uh, I obviously want to try to make sure that that work is meaningful and has the impact I hope. But um, it is, uh, it's interesting. DC is a tough place to find a job when you're a transitioning military vet and you don't really want to go work for a defense contractor. Yeah, and I think I've seen like just from your Twitter, like your your opinion amongst vets is very much appreciated and respected for where you're for your rat. Would you want to stay in that realm, like in doing military stuff? Because I know for me, whenever I got out and I got hired at Barstool, mm-hmm. I wasn't really in love with the idea of having a military show because I wanted to show, look, I'm more diverse than this. Like I I don't want to be pigeonholed into doing this one thing. I want to be kind of outside. Do you struggle with that too? I do, um, because the the military has a way of defining you. Especially when your last name is McCain. (laughs) Especially when when your last name is McCain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. That's Especially if if given the opportunity to go fly again, it's hard to pass up because um, flying is fun and exciting and dangerous and is the most amazing thing I've ever been able to do. So I expected your wife to like bust through the door and be like, you're not doing anything else dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> or at least your mom. I'm sure your mom is like, son, you will stay on the ground. I, I would have to, to get it by her. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's something that gets under your skin and never leaves. I think every, every pilot, regardless of what they get out and go do, always wants to go back. Oh, I bet. Well, Jack, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. If there's anything we could ever do for you on ZBT, just let us know. Hey, I I really appreciate you sitting down and uh, listening to me ramble. Thank you.